Hello, and welcome back to the Worship Team Podcast. My name is Alex Infiegin. I am your host. Today is episode 14 of the podcast, and we have the great privilege of talking with Taylor Knight. Taylor is the technical director of Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago, Illinois, and also works very closely with the Vertical Church Band, whom we all know and love. And so Taylor has a lot of experience with in-ear monitors, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking with him about today. We want to know everything about in-ear monitors for the church. So hopefully by the end of the episode, you'll have all of your questions answered. And if not, Taylor graciously even gave his email address out um, at the end of the episode. So if you really want to bug him, you can email him. Anyway, let's get into the episode and find out if your church needs in your monitors, what the pros and cons are, what you should expect, what kind of setup you should get, all of that good stuff. Let's jump in and find out what Taylor thinks about all this. Hey everybody, Uh, I'm here with Taylor Knight, which is a super cool last name, and Taylor is the technical director of Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago, Illinois. Got that all right, right? That's right. (laughs) And uh, I connected with Taylor kind of randomly. Our church was struggling with our in-ear monitors and the mixes and just getting them to sound good, and so I just went online and I was like, what's the one of the biggest churches I know? Uh, and then I Googled it and, and found um, a couple of email contacts and emailed their tech team. And I didn't expect a reply because, you know, Harvest is a huge church. And I think the next day I got an email back from Taylor saying, hey, I'd love to help you, connect with you, call you. Um, when's a good time to call? We love helping smaller churches get things figured out. And so uh, Taylor graciously called me and spent an hour on the phone with me. And I was like, man, Taylor, this has been super helpful. I would love to take some of the content that you've shared with me to help me with my in-ear problems to the church across the globe. So he agreed to graciously share his wisdom uh, about in-ear monitors. So Taylor, thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, like I said, you know, we, we by number are a large church, but I feel like we're comprised of some smaller local bodies here in the greater Chicago area. And we love, you know, I, I came from uh, a smaller church that grew up and um, I just love helping any local church in whatever way I can. And so um, thank you for having me. Yeah, man. So tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe like your family and then also what you do at Harvest Bible Chapel. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a young guy. I'm 24 years old. Uh, just moved to Chicago uh, a little over a year and a half ago to take this job, uh, this position here at Harvest. Uh, I'm the technical director for our West campuses, so I oversee all of the production and everything from the big events we do. You've probably heard some of the events we do, like uh, Summer for the City and Harvest University and Act Like Men and Vertical Church Band and um, their tours. And so we interact with all of those events and manage those events. Um, my production history has primarily been driven by audio. I'm a front of house engineer by trade. And so, um, that's mainly what I do, but, um, I also, uh, I have to be competent as much as I can be in, in all other areas as well. So, um, yeah, I, like I said, I just got, uh, I just got married after I moved here, married a gorgeous blonde, uh, from school and uh, we've been married just at a year now, as of yesterday, no, two days ago. And uh, no kids yet, it's keeping it uh, keeping it simple. And yeah, we love love being here in Illinois. I'm originally from Knoxville, Tennessee. Hopefully, you can't hear too much of my accent. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's kind of a, just a little bit about myself. Awesome. Okay, so Taylor, I I don't know if you'd call yourself the in-ear monitor expert, but you have definitely a lot of experience with in-ear monitors um, just from all the work you've done at Harvest with the teams each week and then also going on tour with Vertical Church Band and dialing in their in-ear mixes uh, from the the front house board and all that stuff. So uh, I just wanted to tap into your wisdom and insight that you've gained over the years uh, and just help help churches decide whether or not they want in ear monitors or need them, and also uh, help them if they decide that they do get the best out of them possible. So, um, but before we do that, I just want to say I've noticed kind of a trend that uh, a lot of the bigger churches have gone to in ear monitors, and I have this this 
hunch that a lot of the smaller churches are looking at this going, all the big churches have gone to in your monitors. It must be the magic bullet. Um, it must be the thing that's going to solve all of our musical problems. And I know I used to think that before I went to in-ear monitors. So can you uh, maybe paint a more realistic picture for us uh, about in-ear monitors, the pros and cons of using them in a church setting? Just kind of tell us, you know, the good and the bad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. The um, That's definitely a trend, and I think it's a good trend. Um but it's not because it's solving all of the problems that uh, bands and production people are having across the board. It, it does solve some of the problems, but um, practice and hard work uh, as a band and dialing things in and being smart with your resources as an engineer um, is always going to make things better. And so I guess a way, a way that uh, in-ears will solve some of your problems, um, from a production standpoint, you are going to have the ability to um, to kind of isolate uh, that monitoring so that you're not using things like live wedges on stage and you're going to reduce stage noise as well as the potential for feedback. And then on a musician standpoint, you're going to be able to uh, integrate things like click and uh, to go along with loops, which is uh, definitely a, a new thing and, and very prevalent in um, really all of music not just worship world, but just the industry in general. Uh, and then there's also the ability to, sometimes with wedges, you can't, not everyone can afford to have a wedge. Um, so usually with the in-ear monitor situation, everybody has their own mix and they can hear exactly what they need to hear. And uh, for the most part, um, having this kind of better monitoring system does allow a band to be tighter and uh, feel a little more comfortable. And, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not a, it's not like a switch. Uh, it takes some getting used to, but um, it's, it's clearly given some, some tightness and, and uh, yeah, tightness to, to bands. Okay, so tightness, uh, ability to use click and loops, uh, reduce stage volume, reduce chances of feedback. Those are some of the, the upsides of using in-ears. But tell us maybe a little bit of the cons. Like, what are some of the downsides of using in-ear monitors in a church setting? Yeah, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of variables depending on what in-ear system you use, you know, whether it's something that's network-based, uh, like the Aviom uh, mixers or Behringer, Allen and & Heath, and uh, I believe there's still a few others out there that have, have started making systems like this as well, or uh, using something like uh, wireless packs um, and sending mixes to them. So the cons on a production standpoint would be if you're using... I guess actually both of those, whether it's the network-based or the wireless packs, um, that's just a little more work. You know, you, you were still mixing wedges before, but there's just a little more that goes into mixing a pack or mixing a uh, or, or routing for a Avion-based or network-based monitor. So no longer are you just feeding into mixes, but now you're having to say, okay, uh, for the Avioms, i got to direct all this stuff out. i got to build a mix for this and... And, you know, if your band changes every weekend, then your layout of your Aviom changes every weekend. And so you just have one more puzzle piece to, to have to figure out for your weekend services. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not always a convenient thing. Um, on the wireless side of things, you're, you now run into, you know, whether or not you use wireless mics and other wireless technology, you now have the, uh, the wonderful headache of having to deal with RF issues and making sure that you're not having interference or dropouts. Um, which is just one more thing that you have to problem solve. Plus, having to keep up with batteries, making sure that those things are batteried up, and having that in your budget—you know—all those things really add up um, as a as a bit of a headache sometimes. So, and then on the musician side of things, if you've never used in ears before, um, I don't know of any one person that's ever put in ears and then said, "Wow, this is this is the best. This is the easiest." And I don't ever want to do anything else. You know, most most people, especially vocalists, they put those in, and, and it's just a it's a different feel. You know, having the isolated sound of your own voice in your head versus um, having a mixture of the room accompanied by the wedge that's in front of you is just a it's a different feel. And um, as a worship leader specifically, you you know you always hear about guys feeling disconnected from the audience and unable to lead effectively, and you know, kind of be a leader in this, in this spirit led worship movement. And so, um, 
so yeah, that's that's not a not always an easy thing. Yeah, so I mean, it's not all rosy. Like there are upsides and downsides to all this, and um, that's that's really what I want to help churches understand is that it's not like I thought it was. It's not this magic bullet, and I really, really thought that you know if I just buy these things everything's going to get better and the band's going to get better. And it, it wasn't like that. And it, it was tricky and it was difficult and there was a huge transition period and a learning curve. Um, so I just, I want to help churches understand that so that they can make an informed decision on whether or not they should move to in-ear monitors. And then if they do decide to move to in-ear monitors, hopefully by the end of the episode, um, we'll be able to give them some tips and tricks to help them, really get the best out of that. So let's talk about that for a moment. Um, let's say there are two hypothetical churches listening to this podcast, and they've they've weighed the pros and cons, and they're like, yeah, we think going to in-ear monitors is going to be worth it for us. We want to do it. Um, and now we just need to know what kind of gear to buy. So let's say hypothetical church number one is like super rich. There's like unlimited budget. They can buy whatever they want. They they will buy what the pros buy. They'll buy what Chris Tomlin gets um, or what Vertical Church Band gets. Um, and then the other church is more like just an average church with a smaller budget, and they're going to need to you know count their nickels and get the mid-range setup. So I'd like for you to kind of describe both of those setups, the, the fantasy setup that all the churches wish they could have, and then maybe more of a real... Uh, setup that most churches could actually afford like tell us what what's your dream setup taylor like if you could get any setup for the vertical church band tour what would you get yeah 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 so um no budget church one anything you can get um what i've liked most um of the things that i've worked with and what we take on tour with vcb and um and a lot of like what we in house uh, on a good day is is sure PSM nine hundred or one thousands, um, and they are they are quality in two arenas. They're they're uh, RF wise, like radio frequency wise. Um, they're really easy to dial in and sync up and manage. Um, as far as making sure you're not having interference and dropouts, uh, which is great. And then also from an audio fidelity standpoint. Um, they just transmit high quality, and uh, they're not they're not too compressed or uh, anything like that. They have good volume. You're going to get plenty of volume out of them, and uh, you can do stereo or mono. Uh, so they have a lot of flexibility in that regard. And um, we haven't had any complaints at all from any of our guys. And uh, and the PSM the one thousands actually even uh, on the radio frequency side of things, they're they're so technologically advanced that. Uh, they can operate on two different frequencies at the same time so that in the event that one of those frequencies that you set up uh, starts having interference or dropouts, it will immediately seamlessly switch over to the redundant frequency uh, to ensure that you, your musician doesn't lose his ears, uh, which is awesome. And so um, so that's, you know, wireless technology. And uh, and honestly, not just, you know, a lot of people think it's it's just about budget. It's, it's not just about budget. It's even about, like, manpower. So... Um, you know, on tour we do this, you know, but it's not the ideal circumstance. Um, if you have to mix, you know, if you have eight musicians, uh, eight band members on stage, uh, and they all have their own ears, that's eight different mixes that you have to manage on top of managing what's going on in the room. And so um, what we have at our two main campuses here in Harvest are, uh, we have a completely separate console and person dedicated to mixing ears, which is great. Um, that, that, that cuts down on the workload and the capacity of the front of house engineer. And honestly, having that separate console um, helps to make sure that all of the EQing and, com and compression or lack of compression and mix and all that stuff is geared towards um, the ears. Because honestly, anyone who's, who's mixed ears or front of house uh, knows that the way you EQ stuff and the way you manipulate audio for monitors is is quite different than what you would do for from a front of house perspective. So having that dedicated console should also be considered in that budget. And you know, if you have an unlimited source of money, uh, that's great. And usually, uh, just as a little tip, usually you want your front of house console and your monitor console to be the exact same, just for ease of workflow and um, some other things. So that would be the unlimited budget. 
So, um, sorry, real quick. So what you're saying is um, you have two different consoles. You have a front of house console and you have a separate monitor console that's exactly the same as the front of house console. And you've got two different guys mixing two different things. One guy is mixing monitor mixes and he's mi- mixing each mix and sending those mixes wirelessly through the Shure PSM 900s to the team members. Um, and they're listening to those mixes through their earbuds. So can you tell us quickly about the earbuds that you guys like to use? Like what does the vertical church band use? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the actual in-ears themselves, uh, you know, we can uh, we can get away with using uh, universal ears that are like two or three drivers, uh, two or three little speakers inside of of those headphones, and they just you know they're just like little foamy. So you just kind of you twist them up, put them in your ears, and they expand and they they isolate. Or um, the best you know if you have the budget to, and you're talking you know three three to five hundred dollars, maybe more depending on what kind of quality you want. You can get custom molded ears, and so what you do is is you go to a doctor and they'll fill your ears up with a foam like thing. And, and what they do is, is they'll give you a mold of your ear and you send that off to a manufacturer like uh, a big name that you'll hear is like 1964 or um, Ultimate Ears. or um, uh, Those are probably the, the two that I, I'm most familiar with. But they, they are, they're big names in custom ears. And so they'll, they'll mold you a set of ears that are formed specifically to you and you can get, you know, from two two little speakers all the way up to six speakers uh, per side in a set of uh, in ears, which is incredible uh, that that technology exists. And obviously, with that amount of speakers comes a greater fidelity overall and just better range and clarity for what the monitors sound like for that musician. Right. So, so like the really, really, really rich churches buy all of their musicians custom molded uh, 1964s or Ultimate ears, right? Um, and that, and this is just for fun, you know, the fantasy version of, of the best in-ear monitor setups. But can you talk to us now more like on a realistic setup, like what the average church in America who actually has budget constraints, what could they buy? Like what's a more mid-range way to get a good, wire, a good in-ear monitor setup? And then maybe you could even talk a little bit about like the super, super budget version of in your monitors like if there's any way that like a little tiny church in new mexico listening wanted to get in ears but they just have like hardly any money like what would be the ultra budget version of in ears yeah yeah so um the most common the mid to low range uh in your budget would be something like um the avion system or i believe you mentioned alex that you guys have an allen and heath system um but they're there it's the network based system that i was referring to earlier which is um, what's happening is from a front of house or monitor console, you can, you can send up to 16 channels of inputs. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, mixes, one or two channels, or you can send direct outs of those individual inputs to a, a distro. And that distro turns all of that audio into network signal. Um, so you use like a cat five or a cat six cable and that goes to all these individual, uh, mixers. So you have every musician on stage has a mixer and, uh, they can control the volume of all 16 of those inputs. And then they have a basic tone control of bass and treble, uh, for a high and low end. And then they have an overall master level for that as well. And then there's some more flexibility. That's, I'm just kind of describing the basic avium. Uh, structure, but I know Alan and Heath and Behringer, um, they have even more flexibility or even more channels with what you can do. Uh, some of them have the ability, you can actually tone control or EQ every individual channel, even from the mixer itself. Um, as an audio guy and a production guy, I'm, I obviously steer clear of that a little bit. Uh, musicians have good ears, but I think mine is better just because I'm an audio guy. <laughs> So uh, I just think using a using a nice console is better, but obviously we're talking about budget here, so uh, that's really helpful. And then, uh, and of course, you know, like you just use like a headphone extension with a basic set of universal ears uh, for that setup. And then the lower range, like the I think the absolute cheapest I could think of that I've done before it would be uh, uh, like headphone amps. So you can do you can do that one or two ways. Um, this is essentially your you would do the same thing that you would do for wireless in ears. Uh, where you send an individual mix uh, to an individual person down their own headphone amp. Um, but, of course, in this case, there's no wireless. So it's all 
it's all physical and that there's a lot of conversions that usually have to happen for that to take place, you know, from depending on what kind of, um, console you have and, and what, you know, whether it has XLR or quarter inch outputs or something else and, um, whether or not your stage has a, uh, XLR outputs or quarter inch or NL4 or, you know, whatever you might have. Um, so you had to just, you had to, it's not just as simple as, Oh, I'll just get this and it works. You have to figure out what well, works with your system, but, uh, you can usually figure out some kind of conversion to get to individual headphone amps, which are essentially, they're just little amps that are amplifying the signal that you're sending down those lines, and you just have a basic control of volume, and that's it. Um, and then you would also just use, you know, you could use everything from a pair of headphones from Walmart to uh, some decent, uh, you know, single or, or double driver universal ears from Sure or something like that. But yeah, and it's very, like I said, it's pretty basic. Set up. Just to reiterate, like what you're saying is that um, the very cheapest, most basic way to get in ear monitors would be for your front of house guy to use the main mo- the main house console, um, and he's creating uh, monitor mixes. But instead of sending them to wedges, he's basically running a really long ca- uh, headphone cable all the way up to the stage to the person who's correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and like you said, there are some more conversions that need to happen besides that, but that's the basic idea. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of these different hacks um, that that you can do, like a mid-range budget. You can do these little tricks to turn your mid-range budget into something that's a really cool setup. And I think I've seen you guys do this really cool trick at Harvest Bible Chapel. And what that is, is that you guys are basically splitting your front of house board to two different layers. So like, let's say it's a 64 channel board and you only need 32 channels to mix front of house. So what you guys have done, I think, is you've split that board into two layers. So the top layer is the 32 channels to mix the front of house. And then the bottom layer is a duplicate of every single channel that you EQ and compress differently than the front of house specifically for the in-ear monitors. Now that's a really cool trick because you basically have created a monitor console off of your front board. So can you kind of talk a little bit more about that awesome hack you guys did? Yeah, that's actually very very well articulated, Alex. That's exactly what we do for all of our satellite campuses. Uh, we don't have the, the resources or the manpower on our satellite campuses to do what we do on the road or, or at our mains. So we have a, a Yamaha LS9 that has exactly that. It's it's 32 physical faders, but 64 digital uh, channels. And so the second layer is is all of those same th- first 32 channels, you know, digitally represented there, copy and pasted, if you will. And uh, we use that second layer to dedicate, you know, that channel. And obviously, the only thing that that you can't uh, duplicate would be the head amp or the gain. So you know, you set your gain structure for your first layer and then that carries over to the second and then you have a completely separate EQ and routing and uh, effects and all that stuff that you can do on the second layer which is really helpful. Yeah, and that's really, really helpful, like you said, because the EQ that sounds good in the house does not sound good in people's ears and we had to learn that the hard way. Um, So that's super, super good hack. You take one console and you basically split it into two consoles and you duplicate every channel so you've got Alex Voice 1 goes to the house, and Alex Voice 2 goes to my ears, and they're EQ totally separately. Um, you just really need the amount of channels on your console to duplicate all the channels that you need. Um, that's the only kind of barrier that would stop someone from doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. Or if it's not, you know, if you're still in an analog world, obviously uh, duplicating channels isn't really something you can do. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, that's really cool though. I mean, that hack, that idea, if people can do that, split your channels uh, and use one for the house and use one for the ears, like that's going to be amazing. So that's a really great hack to kind of boost your mid-range setup. Here's another one that we've we've done uh, at our church that I think is really cool and I wanted to share it. Um, So if some of the churches are listening have like the Aviom setup, but all of your musicians are like, you know, physically tethered, uh, by their ears to their Avion mixer. Um, one way that you can make that wireless is uh, it's pretty simple. So he- here's what we did. We made our Avion setup. Well, it's actually not Avion, but we made our mi- personal mixing setup wireless. And uh, 
the way that you do that is instead of running a cable out of the back to your ears, you run a cable out of the back to a wireless transmitter, which then beams the signal to your ears. So let me just kind of explain how we did it. Basically, um, out of the back of our Allen and Heath mixers, there's the, the little stereo headphone cable, right? And so instead of plugging headphones into that, I just plugged a stereo cable that splits off into two quarter inch cables and I ran that cable underneath the stage so I actually drilled a hole in the floor pocket and I ran that cable under the stage and I brought it up on the far side of the stage into a little rack that has four wireless transmitters uh, in it and I did this at each at each station where people stand wherever each personal mixer is I, I drilled a hole in the floor ran a cable under the stage and I popped up back where that rack is and I just plugged it into the back of the wireless transmitter so now when they make their mixes instead of it going straight from the mixer into their ears it goes under the stage into the transmitter and beams it wireless wirelessly to them wherever they're standing on the stage and so they can move around they're not tethered and it's not pulling on their ears so that's a really really cool way to let your people still be in control of their mixes but get them untethered so that they can be wireless and free so any other uh, hacks or, or thoughts about hacking your current system to make it better? Um, no, I mean, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty common one, and I think that's a really good idea. I, I can't really think of anything else. Okay. Uh, okay, well, we've covered already the pros and cons. We've explained the different kinds of setups that people can get. And now let's say that these churches have gone out and they've bought their new in-ear monitor setup. Um, now tell us, Taylor, like what are the best practices when using in-ear monitors? Like I've heard things like you should always wear both ears. I've heard that you shouldn't use compression. You should use a separate EQ. You can set up ambient mics. Like all the things that you've learned from, from working with musicians over the years, tell us what are the best practices, not just from the musician side, although we want to know that, but also maybe from the tech standpoint, what are the best practices for using in-ear monitors? Yeah, for sure. So from a from a engineer standpoint, um, the first thing I always tell all my guys when I'm teaching them audio is the first thing that matters is gain structure. So in signal flow um, for audio, the first thing that, that that any input hits on your console is the gain, and if your if your gain structure isn't right, then everything downstream from that is going to be affected. So your EQ and compression, and um, even just the overall tonal quality and the volume, and whether or not your um, you know, like if you ever run into a situation where your your lead singer is like, "Hey, I need more of myself. I need I can't hear myself, and I've got it turned up all the way on my Avion, or you've got it turned up all the way in his mix, and he still wants more," I would say about 99% of the time that's because uh, you don't have good gain structure. Um, you know, you know, you always want to blame your musician and say like, oh, he's being too greedy or he can't hear himself or he's deaf. Um, and I've had my more ignorant days where I thought the same thing. But I think as I've learned, um, there are some good practices like that that you can do to make sure that uh, you're doing the best that you can do. Apart from gain structure, I, I always, less is more in monitor world. I try to do minimal EQ. Uh, most musicians, they need um, and they typically want a, a very true representation of their electric guitar amp or their voice or their acoustic guitar, you know, or, or their their uh, synth sounds on their keyboard, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, they spend a lot of time developing that sound. And so um, you're not doing them any justice by over manipulating that audio so usually uh no compression is where i would always start and then if if it's too dynamic or you feel like you're having to change their mix a lot slowly add that in um but yeah very minimalistic and all that you do in monitor world it's it's all about good gain structure and then from a musician standpoint i'd say kind of working off of that same relationship as you're communicating with your engineer it does this is almost seems secondary but it really is important to to learn the lingo uh, for each of you to kind of ha understand um, what what you're saying, <laughs> you know, uh, I, my guys, you know, like they'll they've at least learned enough, you know. Hey, I, can you gain up my my voice? I can't I can't hear it enough or whatever. And they understand that when I gain something up, 
it changes the volume for them and it usually changes the the tonal quality of it. So they'll ask me that a lot, but ultimately your engineer is in charge of interpreting what's needed. And so the more you can be precise with your language, you know, audio is a hard thing to describe and it's, it's a, uh, it's very subjective at times, especially when you're trying to tell someone what you're hearing in your ears versus what someone else is hearing. And, um, and then as far as the actual practice uh, as a musician, like actually using the ears, um, you'll always hear people debating about whether or not it's best to have both ears in or one ear out or something in between. The problem with that really just lies with, um, it's really just a matter of, of ear damage. So uh, if you have one ear in, one ear out, um, it's just, it's just a law of nature that you're going to have to turn up your ears louder than you would if you had both ears in. Uh, and so now you're, sub- you're subject to some ear damage potentially, you know, it's not always the case, but uh, you're a little more susceptible to it. And if, you know, that's kind of do it at your own risk, be careful doing that. I totally understand uh, needing to be in connection with your audience and trying to lead them well. Uh, but there's some other solutions too, to make sure, you know, like audience mics, and I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, just being watchful of that don't, don't, at least be aware that like you have a risk of doing that. Um, and then, you know, honestly keeping your, uh, your in-ears, not your physical ears, but your, your electronic in-ears, uh, clean, making sure that, uh, they're clear of earwax and things like that. Uh, don't be susceptible to over your physical ears. I uh, don't be, don't be susceptible to cleaning them too much. It's actually not healthy for your ears to be uh, cleaned every single day or too frequently. Um, earwax is, is not a, pesty thing it's a, actually a it's a protective thing that your body does to protect your ears so um obviously you don't want ooze coming out of your ears but uh you want to make sure that um you're not being too diligent in doing that uh you'll your ears will actually become raw after a while so I, was it- i've never talked about earwax on my podcast <laughs> <laughs> hey so uh you talked a little bit about compression. Um, we had a problem with compression a while ago. Uh, when we first got our in-ears, the, the board was digitally sending the signal compressed to our ears, and I just couldn't hear any clarity. Everything was like all uh, hot and crispy is the way that I was describing it. It was like everything just sounded squished together and crispy and like hot, and it just didn't sound good. I couldn't hear any of the definition between instruments and so i finally uh called a few friends and they said it sounds like you've got compression over compressed so don't send uh compression to the in-ears and so if there's any churches out there who are like why do our mixes sound so unclear well check your compression if you're if your board's sending compression to your in-ears that that might be the reason and then you also talked about uh eq like using a different eq from the house than from the ears and uh, when we first moved to in ears, I was I was seriously having pitch issues, and I I rarely sing off pitch, but I was always slightly sharp, um, and it was because our house EQs were they were dipping these huge sections of my voice out of the EQ, and so I couldn't even tell where I was singing because like massive sections of my frequency range were gone in my ears, um, and so. It's really important, like you said, if you can, to either don't EQ the 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 instruments or the voices, or just like you said, use minimal EQ on on the voices and the guitars and stuff. Because people get used to hearing their voice a certain way, and then when in the house they're like dipping huge sections sure. of your voice, it really throws you off. So, um, Taylor, I wanted to ask you also: uh, Have you ever heard of the concept of giving the vocalists like a different mix? than the keyboard, I mean, than the drummers or the bass players. Like, I heard that for vocalists, you should give them more of the acoustic instruments, like the acoustic guitar and the piano, so that they have pitch and timing references. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so um, this is, you know, I'll confess this. Uh, I've had to confess this to other people, too. Uh, honestly, most people don't know this, but uh, even though I've I've been, you know, somewhat successful in as a front of house guy, I'm not a musician at all. So, um, I don't know a whole lot about music. I've just been in the industry long enough to where I, I know enough to, to understand how music goes and arrangements and things like that. And I just, I understand, uh, the basic concepts, but, um, since I'm not a musician, I didn't really know at first, like 
what people need to to do their thing. So, you know, a drummer needs something different than a, a lead vocalist versus a BGV versus a lead guitarist. And so um, you really just have to keep in mind what each of those positions is doing. So, uh, a, you know, a vocalist, like you're saying, uh, they need to be able to, they do need to be on time uh, and they need, they need uh, pitch and so, uh, and key and all that. So usually the first things I'll put, you know, uh, I'll even teach my guys to kind of pre-make, like uh, when we have background vocalists in a weekend, I'll, I'll have them kind of pre-make a mix for them. And it always starts with their vocal <clears throat> at the very top, um, the surrounding vocal. So if they're trying to harmonize with someone or they're uh, following the melody, you know, whoever that is needs to also be very close to their vocal. And then, uh, like you said, making sure that there's keys uh, an acoustic guitar. You, most of our worship leaders will lead with acoustic guitar, so it's good to have that 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 person who's leading the way. Um, and the acoustic guitar just provides some rhythm and uh, and tone as well. And then I'll even make sure that there's something like uh, just a not a whole lot, but just um, if you have click, you know, if you're if you do, if obviously you're using in ears, uh, put the click in there. Or if the click is annoying to them or they're not used to it, at least make sure there's a little bit of kick and snare for timing's sake. And then I'll just start there. And then, uh, you know, some musicians, they like the whole gamut. Like they want to feel the whole experience. So they'll ask for the whole band and they want, they want to hear something that's cl close to resembling the house or, you know, their own wants and desires. And, uh, but as far as what's necessary, uh, that's a good point, Alex, is just making sure that those those basic things are there, and that's that's usually where I start. Yeah. Now, have you ever heard of – I've heard of some churches doing this where they they take their house mix and they send it to the in-ear monitors as an aux channel. And so for people who really want that full big sound to feel like they're like listening to a record, they're they're actually listening to the house mix. They they just turn that up or down and then they just turn themselves up or down and they don't have to worry about controlling all the individual instruments separately as a group. I'm sure there are many downsides to doing it that way, but do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, um yeah, you can do that. Uh that's not a bad idea. The only the only issue comes in, I mean, it just practically speaking, as far as routing things, um, even like even a really nice console doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, there's not a whole lot of ways that you can do that. So like the, the most basic way that a, a, a newer high-end console can send its stereo mix to something is through a matrix. I only have eight matrixes on my console. And uh, depending on, you know, what, like I have at least five other things that need need that same mix before my in-ears do. So like, you know, if you've got a lobby feed or a broadcast feed or a uh, recording or uh, whatever the case may be, you know, those things are going to eat up uh, those sources. So uh, it's not a bad idea as far as ears go. If there's a way that if you have all the, all the things you, you need to, to make that happen for as many vocalists as you need it to happen for, uh, then great. But practically speaking, I just, I don't really have the bandwidth with the resources that I have to to pull that off most of the time. And it's like, but audio wise though, it's not a bad idea. That's, that's probably pretty cool. You know, as long as your musicians, as long as your vocalist is okay with that. Yeah. Do you have any other like tips and tricks, uh, technical things that, that you can tell us to do? Like maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about audience mics. Like I know that we tried using audience mics in our in-ears to, to regain that connection with the congregation. But for me, uh, and it's probably us doing it wrong, it really muddied up my mixes. Like it would just make things really mid-rangey and sound bad. So I ended up turning them way, way, way down in my mixes. But maybe you can talk a little bit about audience mics, which mics to use, mic placement. Just share some of your wisdom on that. For sure. So as I said earlier, um, you know, when you're trying to accomplish that same kind of connectivity between worship leader and the audience, to, to gain back that same like atmosphere and ambience of the room and, and, and just hearing your congregation as well, um, audience mics is a solution, not just for churches. I mean, a lot any any big tour, I can guarantee you, has has this as well. Because it's not just worship leaders that want to feel that. Even even Coldplay wants to hear what's going on in the arena as they're playing. Uh, they want to experience just as just as much as um, the fans do what's going on in the room. So, um, the you know it, it starts with the mic itself. So you have to have a mic that is designed to pick up um, 
what you're trying to pick up. So what we, we always recommend, um, usually a shotgun mic, uh, or some, some kind of, um, probably some kind of, uh, a shotgun is like a pickup pattern. So that's like, you know, you probably heard terms like, uh, cardioid or omnidirectional. It's just kind of the, it, it kind of just determines how it's picking up audio and sh- the shotgun pattern is, uh, what I would recommend for audience mics because it's not going to be too defined. It's going to have some distance on it, and that's really what you need for an audience mic because an audience mic is not something that's going to be very. It's not like you're closely miking your congregation or the room. It's it's something that's very like open, and you don't want something that's omnidirectional necessarily because if you have that, then you're likely to pick up things that are behind it as well. So typically, you want to aim audience mics in such a way that you're not picking up like too much of the band itself or too much of the PA. You're really just trying to get what's going on out in front of you in the room and a shotgun mic is is uh or something very comparable is is the best so you know you can look up any number of those we actually use sure uh it's funny these actually aren't uh, i'm pretty sure the pickup pattern on these actually aren't shotgun but they're they're they work for the rooms that they're in um the sure sm81s they're like a pencil condenser mic uh, you'll see them sometimes on overheads for drums uh you know they work for things like that i guess but the just the the pickup pattern as well as the frequency pickup that they have. I actually have that hanging up in the air in the room that I typically mix in here at Harvest. Uh, and then we also have Audio Technica. Um, I don't remember their model numbers, to be honest with you, but Audio Technica and Sennheiser also make the other two or three audience mics that we use on some of our other venues. But you seriously, if you just look up a, a faithful brand like that, and shotgun pickup pattern, you're going to find something that will work. You don't need anything that's like super expensive um, in the mic world for uh, audience mics, just something that that fits within those parameters. And then once you have that, the two most common ways I've seen or done myself with audience mics is uh, hanging from the ceiling. So this could be uh, a single mic in the very center of your room, hanging down, you know, and I'm, th- I'm talking like 20, 30 feet, above uh above your people's heads depending on how big your room is uh you know as high as you can get it uh without it being too close or you know obstructing view of anything and all that jazz you know there's once again there's always so many variables um and then uh there's i've also seen um a common thing that you'll see on tours is the audience mics are usually right beside the pa right alongside of it pointing out towards the audience uh, sometimes this will be like if you're in a big room with a line array, you'll see it mounted to the bottom of the line array on either side, pointed down towards your audience, which is cool because you're still getting a little bit of pickup from uh, the front of house mix, which is you know a lot of guys like to feel that a little bit. And then obviously you're going to get the the noise from your crowd, you know, claps and singing and uh, response. Um, and then we've also seen uh, like our Meadows campus has steel beams. Uh, up in the top of it that are pretty low. And we actually just mounted uh, audience mics in four different locations uh, in that room. So far left, far right, center left, center right of that room are shotgun mics uh, pointed down towards the audience. And we use that for broadcast as well. Um, so that's one reason why we, w- we had so many. You don't really need that many for just, just your in-ears, but um, that's why we have that. And, and then as far as dialing them in, once you've got those inputs on your console, very minimalistic. Like I put a basic high pass filter on it, usually up to like 100 or 150 hertz. Uh, and then I'll just listen to it. I just use my own ears. And then if it needs to be shaped at all, you know, if it sounds too muddy or uh, it's a little too crispy on the top end or whatever, I'll, I'll dip some of that out. I don't ever add anything to it. I'll just take out what what doesn't need to be there. And, um, and then depending on how dynamic it is and because of where they're placed and things like that, I will, I will do some compression if I need to, this will make it so that it's not too dynamic uh, for your ears. Cause sometimes uh, depending on where they're placed, if it's too dynamic, then it'll throw your band off um, or it'll, you know, it'll be louder than it needs to at times or whatever. And if you compress it, it makes it a little more consistent. And I think you can do that without, without any audio or fidelity degradation. So yeah, does that, is that, that might be too much, but no, no, not at all. Actually, I still have even more questions. Um, like it sounds like you guys have your mics hanging in front of the PA uh-huh. at some of your venues, which I would think would end up making the mic pick up the PA and not the people. So tell us, like, how do you get around that? Like, how do you make sure it's picking up more people than actual PA? 
Right. So if it if you're if you're in that configuration and it is in the middle of the room, it's pointing usually straight down or at an angle away from the PA. So um, and because of the pickup pattern of it, um, it's going to reject some of some of the the PA in that direction, anyways. And you want to make sure like it's far enough out from the PA that that's not going to be the foremost thing that you hear. It's okay if you hear some of the front of house, but you just you want to make sure that the foremost thing that you hear is what's going on in the room. And the, I'm telling you, the, the easiest way to dial that in is just listening to it. Like, like put it somewhere you think it'll work, dial it in, put some put some headphones on from front of house, and just listen to it. And listen to it, how it responds with, you know, your full church in there. Listen to how it responds when the band is, uh, you know, going its hardest. Listen to how it sounds when your pastor's preaching. You know, all of these things, and just play around with it till it's till it's uh, what you need. Cool. Okay. Last question about audience mics. I promise. I want to know how you guys mix your audience mics into your ears. Like, how do you know the right level to add, um, where your musicians are like, okay, it sounds good. I, I hear the congregation, but it's not muddying up my mix. Like I've heard of some churches, uh, mixing all of the band first and then adding in just a little bit of audience at the end. Is, is that what you guys do? Yeah. I mean, honestly, we haven't had like a a uh, workshop on on that or anything like that with our worship leaders, but yes, I would. That's exactly what I would recommend, though. Is is start with with just building your mix for your band, you know, and what you need and 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 all your other inputs. Build that mix first, and then add in the audience mics as as a filler for ambience and um, the room. And most of the time, that's going to get where you where you want to go. And you just have to play around with it, you know. Like as you add that, you for whatever reason, if you if you if you're starting to hear more of something than you were before, you can you can mess around with your mix a little bit more and make sure that's good. And uh, you, I guess the most important thing is you want to make sure that you're not losing anything. So uh, if for some reason, you know, if 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 it didn't get placed right and it didn't get dialed in well enough and you're getting too much of the PA back into those audience mics or something, and you start having phasing issues in your ears, it's because the source of the audience mic versus um, the input source on your avium or your ears or whatever, however you're doing it, is, is they're canceling each other out. So if, if you add those audience mics in and you start to notice some very significant mix changes, that's probably why. So that's uh, if there's not like any one answer to, to solve that. It's just a matter of continuing to dial that in. Yeah. Taylor, man, this has been like super helpful for me and I'm sure all of our listeners. Um, and I just want to give you a chance before you say goodbye to send us off with any final thoughts. Like what would you, what would you leave us with today? Um, yeah. So I, I would just say every opportunity I get to talk to, to other technical leaders or worship pastors and people who are just continuing to try to make the worship environment um, excellent for for God's glory. I would say um, the biggest complaint I always hear is always having to do with budget and leadership, uh, not wanting to go the direction that you want to go. And um, my my immediate response to that is is twofold. It's one, um, you're going to your faithfulness to submit to your leadership and their decision making um, honors the Lord first and foremost. And I think in honoring the Lord, he will bless your ministry and your vision along the way. And that's more of a spiritual thing, um, but I think it's important. And then secondly, um, as far as your budget goes, I mean, the reality is I, your your church leaders, there's some special circumstances out there, I'm sure, but all in all, your church leaders want what's best for your people. And if you want what's best for your people, um, then, then you're on the same team. And so um, as they allow, uh, allow you to to, to to budget for certain resources or all this pretty new gear or whatever, then you you know take advantage of that. But in the meantime, be a faithful steward of what you have. Um, I, I have done excellent production with some crappy gear, and you know it takes a lot of time and experience to dial those you know not so good equipment or whatever. It takes some time to learn how to best utilize those things and squeeze the most excellence out of those things as possible. But I think if you, uh, if you seek out, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there that don't work at their church full time in this capacity. There's a lot of part-time guys out there who are just volunteering their time to lead a whole ministry. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of investment. I get that. 
Um, but the as if you the more resource, resources you can get a hold of with podcasts like this and uh, YouTube videos and uh, resources that manufacturers put out like Yamaha and um, finding information and finding ways to best use the resources you have uh, will really prove to be uh, most serving to your team and worship and production as well as your church body. Pure gold right there. Oh, man. Taylor, thank you. Um, Taylor, if anyone wants to reach out to you online and get a hold of you, uh, how would they how would they find you? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, as the rest of the world does, I guess, I have a Twitter account. Um, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can direct message me or whatever on there. Uh, my username or handle is just Taylor Knight underscore. So T-A-Y-L-O-R-K-N-I-G-H-T underscore. Um, I'm on Facebook. And I mean, why not? Uh, my email address is T Knight, T-K-N-A-G-H-T at harvestbible.org. And uh, just like I got your email, Alex, you know, I, I, I can't always respond to everything, but I, I tried to um, make sure that I make time for other, other local churches doing the same thing that we're doing and uh, try to offer my, uh, my uh, experience. God bless you, Taylor. Man, so encouraging. And I know a lot of uh, people listening to this were, were blessed by your time. So thanks for making the time. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thanks again, Taylor, for taking the time uh, to equip the global church with your insight and wisdom and experience. It was really a blessing. And uh, if you guys are wondering where can we find links to all the different gear that was discussed, I will put it in the show notes for you so it's easy for you to um, do a little bit of research for your in-ear setup that maybe you'll be getting or maybe not. Um, Okay, next month we'll be back with another episode and we will be talking with uh, my senior pastor, Ben Sobels, about the relationship between senior pastors and worship leaders. That should be a great conversation. So I'll see you next month. And in the meantime, have a great weekend leading your church to worship Jesus more passionately. So won't you carry me on?